Welcome to the University of Southampton, our chemistry department. I'm Dr. Simon Gerard, the admissions tutor here, and I'd like to start the day off by introducing our head of department, Professor Phil Gale. Well, um, welcome everybody. My name is Phil Gale, I'm the head of chemistry. Um, I'm going to be talking to you this morning a bit about some of the research that goes on uh, in the department, and I'm going to turn over to Professor Andrea Russell, who's our Director of Programmes, and she's going to tell you some more of the details of the course here. So Southampton um, is a research-intensive university, and chemistry in Southampton is an excellent place to do chemistry research. We have six research sections which are shown on this slide. Uh, these range from electrochemistry, computational systems chemistry, functional inorganic materials and supramolecular chemistry, and I'm a supramolecular chemist. Uh, organic chemistry, synthesis, analysis, and flow, chemical biology, diagnostics and therapeutics, and magnetic resonance. And really, the, the reason to show you that is that, just to illustrate, that we span the whole breadth of chemistry uh, here in Southampton. We also have two cross-cutting um, sections, characterization and analytics, and we also have a, a chemical education research section headed by Professor David Reed, and they do research into um, um, pedagogical uh, methods of delivering chemistry education. So they enhance the way that we teach chemistry in the department. These are just some examples of um, some of the research going on at the moment. Uh, up at the top left, this is some research from Professor Robert Rogers group and Robert is interested in catalysis and finding new ways of making bulk chemical feedstocks without making any waste. Uh, so green, green chemistry. This is some research from um, Ali Tavasoli's group and Ali is a chemical biologist and he's interested in disrupting the interaction between proteins. And Ali's group has been making these flat molecules that can sit at the interface between proteins and protein-protein interactions are important in cancer. And so you can disrupt those sorts of interactions as a potential new way of uh, producing anti-cancer compounds. And then Professor Malcolm Levitt, who's the head of magnetic resonance, is looking at new ways of making long-lived, excited nuclear states in simple compounds like water. And the reason for doing this is you can replace MRI contrast agents, which are injected in with, if you go for an MRI, which enhance the contrast, um, you can use simple molecules like water to do that in the future. And so we have a, a significant research effort in magnetic resonance in the department. But as I said, we, we sp span the whole breadth of chemistry. We have a, um, we're also home to the EPSRC National X-ray Crystallography Service, so you'll have a chance to have a look at that on the tour later today, and we run single crystal X-ray diffraction uh, experiments for researchers across the UK. We, we have the national facility for that, and that means we have the best facilities in the country for small molecule X-ray diffraction. We're a very entrepreneurial um, department, I'll tell you a bit about that, and um, some of the investments that we've made recently. What do our students say about us? Well, these are some of the recent national student survey results from 2015. We're currently doing 2016 survey at the moment, and this, this, this is a survey for students in the final year. Um, so some of the statistics, satisfied with teaching on the course, 95%. Staff are good at explaining things, 100%. Course is intellectually stimulating and satisfied with learning resources on the course. But perhaps most important to you is your employability after getting a chemistry degree in Southampton, and that's uh, excellent. What do people outside the university say about us? Well, every six or seven years in the UK, the whole of the country undergoes uh, a research assessment exercise, which is now called the Research Excellence Framework, or REF. And every department and every university is assessed. Um, the last one of these happened in 2014, um, and we were ranked sixth in the UK for research intensity. So we're a top 10 UK chemistry department. We're in the Premier League in Europe, we're one of the um, one of 13 UK-based 
departments in CHE, Excellence Ranking, which is a, a ranking from Germany. And in the Academic Ranking of World Universities, which is um, the Shanghai Jiao Tong Index, we're ranked fourth in the UK uh, in, for chemistry behind Cambridge, Oxford and Imperial. And this is the second year that we've, we've been uh, maintained our, our ranking of fourth. All our degrees are accredited by the Royal Society of Chemistry and we've recently undergone an accreditation process. Uh, and basically what that means is the RSC is saying that the chemistry degrees here are suitable if you want to go on for a career uh, in chemistry. And we're only one of seven um, UK chemistry departments to have been awarded Athena Swan Silver. So Athena Swan uh, is a project to promote diversity and equality, particularly for female students and academics. And Andrea and I have been involved in our Athena Swan effort over the last few years. And really it's to make it a, a better working environment for all our staff, particularly uh, female members of staff. So just to give you a picture of the department, we have about 50 um, academic staff, about 41 postdoctoral fellows. So these are um, people who've done a PhD but want to continue in research and do a, three, a two or three year uh, postdoctoral project. We have about 200 postgraduate students. But the majority of those are PhD students, so people doing a three or four year research project. And we currently have 522 undergraduate students, which gives us a staff student ratio of 11 to 1. We also have, um, in addition to teaching excellence and research excellence, a strong entrepreneurial outlook in the department. Over the last 15 to 20 years, we've spun out four companies from chemistry, and two of them are actually still partially based in the department. So Illica is a high throughput materials discovery company that was founded by Professor Brian Hayden. Uh, and they floated on the uh, alternative investments market back in 2010 then. And they're a very successful company that discover new materials by producing blends of different compounds and producing wafers with, with the rates of materials on them. And you'll have a chance to have a look at the advanced composite materials facility that's within chemistry but collaborates strongly with Illica on the tour. Uh, this afternoon. And ATD Bio uh, is a company that produces custom made DNA and RNA for other academics and for industry and they're based in Building 30 so you get a chance to, to look at the synthetic labs in Building 30 this afternoon. We have strong links with industry throughout the course though so students who are going on six months or one year placement have the option of going into industry and some of our partners are, are shown on the slide and there's a wide range of companies that you can visit from pharmaceuticals to petrochemical uh, industries. Merck uh, is based in Southampton, so there's a whole range of opportunities. The bridge from going from building 29 to building 30, I don't know if you noticed when you came over, we have the names of all the companies that we interact with on the bridge and so you can take them when, when you go back into building 30. So I guess to summarise, the student from Southampton, you get a, an academically stimulating experience pursuing your chemistry degree here, but it's also a relevant degree that leads directly into careers in chemistry and careers outside chemistry that use the skills that you've developed during the course of your degree. The point of today is to give you information for you to make a choice about whether to do a chemistry degree and whether Southampton is the right place for you to do that. One of the biggest resources that you'll encounter today are our students. So student, you'll be meeting students who are undergraduates here and also students who are doing PhDs uh, who did their undergraduate uh, studies in Southampton. So please take that opportunity to talk to them and ask them what it's really like to study chemistry here. So um, are there any questions for me before I Hand back to Simon. No? Okay. Well, actually, I'm going to hand back to Andrew. Oh, no, no Simon, Simon, you're going to do the, uh, the logistics bit. Yes. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. I just want to uh, go through a few of the logistics and arrangements for the afternoon. And first, a little bit of health and safety. 
So uh, we'll be, this afternoon we'll be dividing you into a blue group and red group, both the applicants and the parents and guests, and uh, we'll be giving you a badge to wear. So please do wear that badge at all times this afternoon so we can identify you. Um, try and keep your bags and belongings with you at all times. Um, this is a, mostly a public access area, although you'll be going into some swipe card access areas as well. In the event of a fire alarm, and there are no planned fire alarms today, um, our students and staff will guide you out the building to the assembly point behind the library. If you do feel unwell at any point or need first aid, let us know. We have a very comprehensive system of first aid, as you can imagine, for a chemistry department, and we'll send someone to see you straight away. For all the parents and guests, we are loaning you some safety specs to wear today. For all the applicants, you'll be getting a nice free pair, branded Southampton, please feel free to wear them wherever you like. And uh, we'll be asking you to wear those in the laboratories at all times. Also, try and keep your mobile phones switched off in the labs as well, because they're working labs, it's a working department, there'll be students and staff. And if you do get lost, please try and make your way back to the main entrance area, and we'll direct you to the right place for the afternoon. So just a brief discussion of what's happening this afternoon. You'll be back to uh, register in chemistry at 1.45 after your campus tour and lunch. And so then at 2 o'clock, the applicants, the red group applicants, will be going on department tour. And the blue group applicants will be having their one-to-one -one meetings with academics. So there are a few formal interviews here today. But for most of you, this is an informal chance to have a chat with a member of staff so use it as a platform to discuss your motivations, ask questions, for you to get to know us a bit more, for us to get to know you as a person. At 3 o'clock, we'll be swapping around. And for the parents, blue group will be heading on a tour, followed by the red group afterwards. But you are more than welcome to stay in the common room for the whole afternoon, have a cup of tea and coffee and have some biscuits from us. At the end, at 4 o'clock, we'll be meeting back in the common room uh, for some closing remarks, and uh, then you'll be free to leave for the uh, rest of the day. But you're more than welcome to stay on a bit longer if you'd like to have uh, extra cup of coffee before we head back home and to uh, ask questions. We'll be there for some time. Okay. I'd like to now hand over to Professor Andrea Russell to continue the rest of the talk and give you all the details of our degree programmes. Thank you very much, Simon and Phil. So, um, how many of you came for one of our UCAS Open Days earlier in the year? So at that open day, you may have had a talk from me or one of my colleagues. We told you that if you came back for the visit day, we would give you all the details about the program. So that's what this part of the talk is designed to do, is to fill you in a bit more of the details of our degree program. So please ask me questions if, you have, if I'm not answering all the ones you have in mind. Okay, so where are we at this point? Well, you should have been received an offer, most of you. Um, I have a place to study here at Southampton, so you should know what your offer is. And then we've invited you to attend today for the UCAS visit day. There's a few of you who are waiting to receive your offer following the formal interview. These are our standard offers this year for 2016 entry. So AAA to AAB for MChems and the MSI, and AAA to ABB for the BSc. But you should know what your offer is. And so today, and the rest of what you're going to do, is about making this decision. Having decided to apply to Southampton, having the offer, you come here to see whether this is where you'd like to put as your first choice. And we want to answer those questions for you so that you make an informed decision. So, you should know that we offer a variety of chemistry degree programs. So we have the BSc, which is a three-year degree. We have five flavors of MChem degree. So from the fully in-house program, two with placements, one a six-month placement, one a year-long placement. We offer two chemistry with degrees. That's the chemistry with medicinal sciences. This one includes a placement. And then chemistry with mathematics, which doesn't include a placement, but has a lot of maths as given the type. Right. Finally, we offer an MSI program. And this is chemistry and biochemistry. This is the one program that is not accredited at this time, although we will be seeking accreditation in the future. So this is a 50-50 split between chemistry and biochemistry, and it takes four years, but it's a fully in-house program. The nice thing about our programs is that there's plenty of opportunity to switch between them, and I'll explain that in more detail in a moment. In terms of the first and second year structure, I'll slow down a little bit and let's have a look at this in detail. We take three quarters of your time in the first and second year is spent on your core chemistry, unless you're doing the 
and the sign chemistry and biochemistry, where it will be mostly chemistry in the first year and then mostly biology in the second year. So these core chemistry modules are made up an organic, an inorganic, and a physical chemistry module, one each, in each of semester one and semester two. Just a few late entries. Please have a seat. No, don't worry, don't worry. So organic, inorganic, and physical chemistry are taught in the first and second semesters of both the first and second year. The way the assessment is made up is that you have 75% of the assessment is from an examination taken at the end of the semester. You are prepared for that examination through workshops and tutorials and other problems classes. And then the other 25% is made up of the practical experience. And you'll have a chance to see our teaching labs later today. What are the subjects that we cover in this core chemistry? Well, there's some physical chemistry, radiation and matter, electrochemistry, kinetics, and spectroscopy, wave function as an atomic structure. I'm a physical chemist. Um, then we have our organic chemistry bits, and there's some inorganic chemistry in here as well. So this is just to give you a flavor of the topics that you'll be covering. Um, over those modules. The other quarter of your time, one module in each semester is made up of your electives, and there's a wide variety of electives for you to take, both within chemistry, within other sciences, and then if you're interested in other things, the university offers a wide variety. So for example, if you're interested in philosophy, you can take philosophy modules at the end, in each of the semesters in the first and second year. Right? There's a whole list of these. And we've come up with themes for our, our option modules, so that if you want to give your option modules a flavor to make your degree different from somebody else studying chemistry, you can do that and set out that from the beginning. But there's a wide variety of these modules. Um, they don't all have prerequisites, so you can change your mind as you go through and, and as your interests develop about your degree. But that's the structure of the first and the second year. In terms of the way we teach, well, we give lectures. So you can imagine yourself sitting in a lecture theater just like this one, perhaps a bit larger for our first year class, which is typically about 180 students in it. Right. So we have lectures, large lecture theaters. A member of staff stands at the front and tells you about things. It's a very interactive style. It's not a presentation like this. So we use things to allow you to think about it as we go along. We do workshops. If we have a class of 180 to 200 students in the first year, we break you down into groups of about 30 students for workshops. This is a two hour long session. The problem sheets are either put up on Blackboard, which is our virtual learning environment ahead of time, or made available as you walk in the room. And then you work in small groups in that workshop working on the problems. There's a member of academic staff and probably one of our postdocs or postgraduate students there as well to work around the room and assist you in solving those problems. So it's really an interactive learning process. We then break you down further, especially in the second year, into tutorials. As for organic and inorganic chemistry, this is a preferred method of teaching. And so for tutorials, you'll be in a group of about eight to 10 students, sometimes as small as six, depending upon how the timetables work out. With that, the work is given out to you ahead of time. You hand it in. The tutor who's taking the tutorial then can then reflect upon how the students have done and tailor the way the delivery of that tutorial is happening to address the specific learning needs of the group of students that they're dealing with. It's really important to do tutorials to hand the work in ahead of time. And then, of course, we have the laboratory classes. The Royal Society of Chemistry requires us to provide 300 hours of contact time in laboratory-based classes, or 300 hours of time, I should say, in laboratory-based classes that might be preparative work, getting ready to take the lab, as well as being in the lab, over the course of the first two years of a BSc degree, and 400 hours over the course of the first three years of an MCAM degree. So you're going to spend a lot of time in the practicals. The great thing is, when you go around and talk to our students, this is the bit they love. This is the bit that makes you a chemist and makes a chemistry degree. The time you spend in the lab, working with your colleagues, learning the techniques, spending the time at the bench, and gaining the skills. We then expect you to do some self-study. <coughs> now, 
We support your teaching, our teaching and your learning through our education development group. And we develop a whole variety of resources to support that, that learning. So in doing so, Phil's already told you that we have a cross-cutting research group on that chemical education. And what they do is they have a look at all the latest resources that are available. For example, Southampton Chemistry was one of the first in the country to introduce these in-lecture response systems. Those of you who came for the UCAS Open Day <coughs> earlier in the year, the University Open Days, would have used those zappers to answer questions while you were here. So we use this to gauge students' understanding of things right live in the lecture, and then we can address those issues. We also have online free laboratory instructional videos. We use tablet PCs. I'm the director of programs. This is one of my lectures on electrochemistry. The bit that's printed, um, typed up, is on the handout that the students get ahead of time. So all of our handouts are loaded up on the blackboard at least 48 hours before the lecture. So you can download the handouts ahead of time, think about the lecture you're about to have, and then when you come to the lecture, you can annotate the slides along with the lecture and fill in the blanks. So that's the style of teaching that I like to use because it's very interactive and gets the students to engage in the thought process with me. I'm so committed to this that we bought six of these tablet PCs, so organic, inorganic, and physical, and years one and two each have one. We use online self-assessment methods, so this may be either to review how you did after a lecture, or it might be to prepare you for a lecture. Those online self-assessments are then fed back to the lecturer, and again, they can address issues that are arising with a group of students. As A-levels change, the issues that students have changed. So we have to keep this a very dynamic relationship. So here's just an example of students watching some of the pre-lab videos. All right, so what does a typical student's timetable look like? This is a real student from our first year of last semester. All right, so it's from semester one. And you can see that this student has their laboratory class on Monday afternoons. In the first year, your practicals are um, from one until six. Um, one, yeah, one till six on Monday or Tuesday, or next year they'll also be from nine till two on Wednesday mornings. They had a pre-lab lecture beforehand and then spent the day in the lab. On Tuesday, they have a few of these workshops, these double period sessions. Note that this one's in chemistry and maths. So it's part of the physical chemistry course. You take an elective module. I think the student was taking Chem 1008. Um, and then they have their chemistry lecture. So inorganics here, physical there, and organic there. So what do you notice when you look at this timetable? There's a lot of empty space, isn't there? Okay. So you're paying 9,000 pounds worth of fees, but there's a lot of empty space. Well, compared to most degrees, chemistry has a lot of contact hours. Okay? There's about 26 hours a week of contact for a chemistry degree, depending upon which option module you do. But you're coming to university to read the subject. That's to fully immerse yourself in the subject. And to attain that professional level of understanding, you need the time yourself to engage with the subject, to write up your lab reports, prepare for the experiments you're about to do, to reflect on the lectures and do the background reading. And so this is what I think your timetable really looks like. Okay. So let's go back to Monday. I mean, I had my pre-lab lecture at 11, but I think this student really ought to do some organic revision and a bit of inorganic catch-up um, in the morning. I'm a morning person, so I like students to get out of bed in the morning and engage with their studies, right? And then they've got their lab, but they've now been studying all day. And after you finish the lab at the end of the day, you're going to be tired. So I think this is a good evening to have off and do your grocery shopping, okay? And then as we go through the week, you can see I filled it in with various bits of study, organic revision, inorganic chemistry lectures, um, but various bits of study to do things. I'm realistic. I mean, this, I've got to have some breaks. I make, you need to make sure you eat, right? It's important to eat, especially breakfast. Um, Friday evening, you're a student. You're probably going to go out. So I'm going to say, do a little bit of work before you go out. And then about 7 o'clock in the evening, start to get ready to go out, go out with your friends because you went out, so let's see, Saturday morning, I think you're probably going to lie in, right? But you know, after, after lunch on Saturday, get in some more study time, catch up on your lecture notes, 
And then, well, I really think you probably ought to maintain contact with your family. Phone your mother, she's going to worry. Um, do your laundry so you don't smell. And then do a bit more work before going out tonight. So this is what I think your real study looks like. Um, an undergraduate degree, no matter what subject you study, is 40 hours a week of your effort, minimum. Right? So it's a full job. Right? You're coming here to immerse yourself in the subject, and this is what we think you should do. Right? I show you this, and you can laugh, but I used to show these slides to our undergraduate students in the first year, at the end of semester one, after they had done their first set of exams. When I had sort of a review lecture with the students, I said, well, how did semester one go? What did you do? And then I showed them what I thought they should have been doing. And the class went, why didn't you tell us this at the beginning? So now, as part of the induction week, if you come here, you'll get to see these slides again. And we'll have a little lecture on time management and how you're going to manage your own studies. Because there's a big step up, step up for me first. In terms of our teaching labs, as you can see, you're going to spend five hours a week in the lab, plus the one hour pre-lecture. Um, what we want you to do is to develop your skills and apply the theory. We use a variety of assessment methods. So the pre-lab is assessed, the practical outcome in the lab, what you've actually done in the lab, and then you have to write up a report and do some exercises. We maintain a very high um, demonstrator to student ratio. So it's nine students for every one demonstrator in the lab. We do this so that you have someone to speak to as you go along. How many of you feel that you're really prepared for practical chemistry at university level by your A level? No one. You really won't have been. And so our first year practical course builds upon the few skills we think you probably have. Semester one is a progressive program throughout the semester that gives you the basic training in how to be a chemist and develops those basic skills. In semester two, you start to do some more interesting experiments. And by the second year, then we can take the gloves off and do some really exciting chemistry. So there's a variety of things, ways we um, assess this and, and as we go along. And this is just a picture of one of the videos. How many of you are doing A-level maths? We don't require you to have A-level maths here at Southampton, so we support your learning and your physical chemistry understanding by providing you weekly math support. So we have a lecture each week on mathematics as part of the chemistry degree. It's given by chemists. And then you have a one maths workshop every week right, in the first two semesters and more in the third semester so that we provide that. And it takes you basically from AS level to just above A2 level. And the reason we need to do this is because physical chemistry is full of a lot of mathematics. And we want to make sure you have the tools to succeed in physical chemistry. And by doing this, we've seen far better progression of our students through physical chemistry. If you're really excited about maths and aren't doing the M and have with maths, there are other maths modules for you to do. Um, this one, Maths 1008, is for those of you with an A or B at A-level maths. And um, Maths 1004 is for the students who have at, at least a C in GCSE maths. But it, it, at least a C in AS-level maths, sorry. All right, so in terms of our support, moving on a little bit more quickly now, in, we have a case study here. So our students were having a little bit of an issue with one of the organic concepts of organic chemistry. Professor Richard Brown, who's one of our members of staff, recognized this and then used our tablet PCs to develop an additional resource for the students. And I'll just let you, sorry, I have to hit go on this. Simon, help me with the video. He had to develop this additional resource to give students some online support. And we're increasingly <coughs> doing this, where we recognize there's a problem, we can step aside and create a resource that students can access at any time. And so I'm just going to play a little clip of it now. One which you should have seen many times by now, which is ethyl acetoacetate. So it's the ethyl ester of acetoacetate. And the important thing to recognize is that this is a dicarbonyl, but the protons on the carbon in between the two carbonyl groups are by far the most acidic.
that, but I'll just go through the mark scheme now. So I thought of this as a, a, a suitable uh, mark scheme here. So for, for each of the intermediates, so I would give yourself, if you've got structures A and B correctly, I'll give yourself three marks for each of those. Three marks for A, three marks for B, and uh, two marks for C. example of the kind of resources that we create as we go along. In terms of the second year, the teaching labs are in there for eight hours a week. We have to get to that 300 hours over the course of the first two years. Um, again, we can't write the components embedded as part of the course, as I've explained previously. And here we're just extending the level of chemistry that you're doing. So we're moving on, preparing you to do a research project in your third year. As I've said, all of our programs have, or maybe I haven't said, all of our programs share core chemistry in the first two years. And what this allows us to do is to have flexibility amongst all the chemistry programs, including the MSI chemistry and biochemistry, that went up to the end of the first year. For all the rest, really well into the third year, you can still change your mind about which degree program you're on. Do you want to do a placement? Do you not want to do a placement? Would you like to switch from BSc to MChem or BAM? So we have a great deal of flexibility, and you'll be guided through all of that by your personal tutor and our year tutor team. Okay, so moving on to years three and four now, giving you maybe a little bit less detail here because things change as we go along. And really you need to know exactly which program you still want to be in by the third year to make this completely relevant. But our BSc degree, in first semester one, you're going to be doing some core chemistry modules, your last core chemistry in organic, inorganic, and physical chemistry, and then semester two, you're going to do option modules. The rest of the year is made up by either our advanced practical course, which is the mini research projects in semester one, followed by a literature research project in semester two. This is great for the student who's thinking, actually, I've done my chemistry degree and I want to go into law or accounting or something else like that, where literature research skills and the ability to handle that kind of information might be very important. Otherwise, you'll be doing an independent research project embedded in one of our research groups. If you're doing the MCAM in-house, you do the same thing in the third year in terms of core and optional modules, but you do this advanced practical in the, in the, over the course of the year. But you do five of the mini research projects and you don't do the literature project yet. The literature will be part of your research project in your fourth year. So in that fourth year, in semester one, you spend the full semester, full time, in someone's research lab. This is your chance to practice being a PhD student if that's what you want out of your future. So you're in someone's research lab all the time, and then at the end of the semester, that semester in semester two, you do your final advanced optional modules, and these are at the master's level. So the research project in this case runs from October to December full time, and from January to March part time. So that's where you're just coming in and doing those last few experiments to tie off things. MCAM with six month placement. Year three looks very much like year three for the other programs, except that you spend 25% of your time doing the research project. So that's in one of our research labs. And this research project prepares you to do your industrial placement or academic placement research project elsewhere. Then you return and do your optional modules. So those placements take place from July to December in the fourth year. And James in a moment is going to tell you about his placement. And those placements can be anywhere in the world. If you want to be in the UK, we request that, that placement is in industry. If you want to go and explore some other academic lab, that place can be anywhere in the world. And I should say the assessment is my dissertation. We assess your placement performance. You have an oral exam. And your placement supervisor will give us a report as well. If you're going to do an academic placement elsewhere in the world, where they wouldn't be paying you a stipend for the time you're working with them, 
we are able to provide you with a travel bursary and some additional financial support. So that our students are not limited financially in their ability to take up those placements in Rivermore. MCAM with a year-long placement, there's two varieties of these right now. You can either do the placement in your third year, so you would do your placement first in your third year, going out in July, coming back um, the following year. Start, those placements would start any time between July and September. And 75% of the marks for that year come from that industrial placement. There's a variety of assessments for that. And then 25% is by distance learning. So there's packages of work that go out to you and you come back and take some exams. These placements need to be within easy access of the UK or Southampton actually, so that you can come back occasionally for various support workshops. The project year is 75% compulsory modules and their research project. This would either be in the third year before you went out in your placement for the year or your fourth year upon returning from the placement. We're going to gradually phase out the third year out. So your intro year will be the last year offered the third year placement. But you will be offered both. Here's just an example of our placement locations over the last 10 years. So you can see our students have been a large number of places. We are very successful in finding places for our students around the world. Very rarely does a student not secure a placement and be forced to stay in Southampton. I can only think of three or four in the last four years. Right. But you can see they go all over the place. I mean, so you find some interesting ones. Well, if James would like to tell you about his interesting one. So the EdChem placement is a great opportunity. It prepares you to either do further academic research, it prepares you in terms of your life experience, and it may offer you an industrial experience to think about is that the industry you want to spend your career in. I'm now going to hand over briefly to James, who's going to tell us about his six-month placement at the University of California, Berkeley. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'd like to come down and just do a quick five-minute talk today on my placement, as Andrea said, at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, so, just to clarify, this placement, this is a six-month placement, so it starts at the end of the third year, and the first three months are when you would have summer, and the second three months are at the start of the fourth year, and most people come back just before Christmas. I think one or two people came back after Christmas, but my mum didn't, didn't want that. So uh, I came back for this in time late December. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Berkeley itself. It's, it's on the west coast of America, just outside of San Francisco. Um, and I was there using NMR spectroscopy, which is a technique I, I imagine you've covered if you're in your A-levels at the moment. I was using NMR spectros spectroscopy to perform high precision physics experiments. Uh, but I, I, I won't go into any detail on the actual research. So a big worry that people have is how to find these placements. Because in, in some way it's almost like looking for a job, even though obviously it's only a six month placement. It's almost like looking for a job that's not actually really advertised for. But there's a lot of support within the department itself to help find these placements. And so I went to one of our research members of staff, who I was working with at the time, and told him I was really enjoying the project that I was working on, I enjoyed the subject and asked him if he had any kind of friends out in America whose labs did similar research that I could, that I might be able to join. So he put me in touch with Dimitri Budka and I sent Dimitri an email with a CV attached and just explained why I was interested in his research. And you know, luckily he got back and said that he'd be happy to take me on for six months. To some degree it's almost like a, he almost got like free research for six months, so it's, it was, uh, I guess, quite useful for him as well. While you're away, there's a lot of support from Southampton itself, from the placement coordinator, Paul Duckman, on the left, who oversees the entire module, and an individual member of staff who's your placement advisor, who works in a similar area and can advise you on the actual research you're doing. So in my case, I did a few problems very much in the physical chemistry department. There's no assessment for the six-month placement while you're away. I think that's not true for the, for the one-year placement. I think there is there's distance learning for that. But for the six-month placement, it, uh, there's no assessment, so you can focus fully on whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, and when you come back, you have something like three to four weeks from after you get back to write up your work in the dissertation and then submit that. And I think most people will advise you 
to sell that while you're away. You start writing you know, the outline of it. So it really is a great opportunity. I, I, I would definitely advise people to do it because uh, there's, there's very few other opportunities to just go away somewhere for six months and experience a completely new culture and meet people that you would otherwise never have the chance to sort of meet. So I'd certainly, I'd definitely look into it. Um, and if, if you decide that you do want to go into research further, this is a great opportunity to meet people around the world and build up research collaborations. And so a perfect example is that the guy who I worked with, Dimitri Bucher, after I'd left his lab in Berkeley, he set up a new lab in Mainz, Germany, and so the following summer, just after I graduated, I got back in touch with him and I said, you know, can I come back and work for you for another three months just before I start my PhD? And he said, sure, like, you come on. I've got a final slide just to show you places around the world where people in my cohort alone went, and you can see it really spanned across, across the world where people have gone, including Australia, I think that was James Cook University in Australia, Caltech, Santa Barbara and Berkeley, all down the west coast of America. Uh, people stayed in Europe, went to Sweden, people went down to New Zealand and across to Singapore. Uh, just a few examples of where people have gone. Does anybody have any questions? That's all right, you've got plenty of time to ask questions this afternoon, and so you'll all think of them about then. Okay, so let me move along, so I, I take too long to talk. All right. So, in terms of our combined honors programs in years three and four, what they look like is the MCAM with medicinal sciences, this is very much based upon the MCAM with six month placements. You also do a six month placement. But your core modules are spread between chemistry and medicinal sciences in year three and in year four. So you do a combination of the two. Has anybody applied for MCAM with maths today? Okay. So we're one of the very few places that still do an MCAM with maths, and we're very proud of this program. All the way through, you do maths modules. You're following much of the same modules as a student studying a maths degree, and you'll be studying with them. In the third, in, at the part way through the second year, you'll need to decide whether you want to do pure maths or statistics. Right? You don't have to make up your mind at that point, but once you do, then you follow that stream. In year three, you'll do half of your core modules be core chemistry, and the other half will be maths and um, chemistry optional modules. So you'll maintain your maths all the way through. And in year four, your research project will need to involve some maths. So you'll do a project perhaps with one of our theoretical chemists, but you could do organic chemistry and still embed some mathematics in that um, in that project. So it will be completely open to you. You'll do optional modules in chemistry, but the other half of your option modules will be mathematics. So it's followed all the way through. Anybody applying for the MSI chemistry and biochemistry today? So I'm not going to cover this one in detail, but you can see that just like the MCHEM with maths, there's a mixture of chemistry and biomedical sciences. And finally, we get on to the option modules at the end of the third and the fourth year. And we have a wide variety of these. We are a research-led university, so these option modules originate with our research groups and cover the breadth of our research experience. Finally, I'm going to hand over to um, Professor Phil Gale, who's going to briefly tell you about that research experience, while I apologize to people outside for taking too long. Okay, so um, James has told you about the research uh, placements that we're doing overseas for six months. Also, students do a research project while they're in Southampton in third or fourth year. And they join a research group when they do that. So, um, all the research members of academic staff have a group, they have postdocs and PhD students working with them. And the undergraduate will join that group uh, and will get one to one supervision from the supervisor. But we'll also normally be working with one of the postdocs or senior PhD students. Um, <clears throat> all our projects have a literature component, and they're really sort of like mini PhDs that they you'll have to write an introduction to your dissertation. You write a dissertation about the research you've done, and then you're examined by a viva, so a verbal uh, examination on the dissertation. Um, but what, what I wanted to highlight was that many of our undergraduate students actually have very successful research projects and contribute to research papers. And these are 
just a selection of papers that have been published uh, in the last year that have undergraduate research, uh, undergraduate uh, students on them. And of course, when you're going for a job, you can actually say that you've got a, a paper and that's going to enhance your CV and make it really stand out. And of course, we can't guarantee that with this research. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, but many of our students are very successful. One example is um, Steph Chapman, and Steph did her undergraduate project with um, Robert Roger on catalysis. And she actually went on to win the Salters Prize in 2015. And she's the third female student in Southampton that's won the Salters Prize since 2011. So this is the prize that's given on the basis of undergraduate research. So what can you expect on graduation? Well, about 54% of our students continue to study chemistry, the vast majority doing a PhD. You're very employable, we have excellent employability statistics. And chemistry uh, financially is the third uh, highest financial return over the term of your career behind medicine and dentistry. So I think what Southampton offers really is a challenging environment for you. We're a research-led department, but we're student-focused. Um, you'll have contact with industry throughout the course um, and we also have an emphasis on developing you as a whole person so you develop soft skills that you'll need to do well in a job interview when you're interviewing for your research placement and this is all part and parcel uh, of our course. So with that, um, thank you again for coming. I'll hand back to Simon now and we'll tell you what's going to happen next and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Great, well thank you very much for watching the talk today. Um, we'll be now heading off on campus tours and lunch. You'll all get a free complimentary lunch voucher as well, so you can use that on campus. And I'll just bring our students in to uh, come and meet you. Are you glad to come on for Okay, great. Okay, so we have uh, Chuck and Tommy will be your guides for the campus tour today. Um, if you want to have a little wander around campus yourselves, um, they'll be happy to point you to the lunch place first and so you'll have free to have a more informal, flexible uh, trip around campus and lunch. But otherwise, um, enjoy this uh, section of the day and we'll see you again at 1.45 for registration at the main entrance in chemistry. Thanks very much.